a friend of a friend, just 23, 24 years old, uh, went to medical school and found himself really for the first time in his life, not surprising at that young age, in a delivery room where a woman was giving birth to a child. He'd always heard that delivering a child was a rather painful experience. And so he was surprised that the mother entered into the final stages of this birth shouting, joy, joy, joy. And then a couple of hours later with the baby, baby safely born and now with the mother holding that new treasured life in her arms, the doctor in training had a chance to go back and talk to the woman. He he said, I was so moved. The way that you were shouting for joy, even in the midst of the difficulty of the labor. And she said, oh, you have a lot to learn. <laughs> joy is the name of the nurse. And I was shouting in agony for her to put it to an end. Well, hopefully, if you know nothing about Christianity, if you knew nothing about Christianity before you walked into this worship service today, you would have figured out by now that this is a day of joy. Seeing the streamers, the gold streamers here behind me as, a, as an enhancement to our sanctuary, drawing in the aroma of these flowers in the worship service today. If you can't smell them in the back, make sure you get a whiff coming up here later following the service. Um, adding your voice to the swell of the music that has already been presented in our midst. Even our banner over there that once was bare and dull is now bursting forth with lights on it as the children on the road having their roots in our faith are now given wings to fly because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, maybe, maybe noticing something in the expression of someone sitting next to you on this joyful day, someone smiling. Wait, there must be somebody. I think there's some, there's one. Yeah, you stand up. Show everybody your smile. Amen. See, this is a day of joy. Like childbirth, however, the joy of Easter only comes after a time of pain. Or to put it more starkly, the joy of new life only comes after death. Both literally and figuratively this day. Truth be told, the resurrection of Jesus is even more wonderful and disorienting than a child emerging from the womb. The birth of a child is crazy, right? But it is a perfectly natural process. With Jesus, though, new life springs forth unnaturally, unexpectedly from the nothingness of death. When Jesus was killed, his body wasn't the only thing nailed up there on the cross. After he died, his body wasn't the only thing lying there in the tomb. Along with him there, also pierced, bloodied, and dead were the, the courage, the hope of the people. His death was not simply the end of his life, it was the death of life's meaning for his followers. You see, there was a lot riding on Jesus, there was a lot riding on how his story turned out. The hopes and fears of all the years, so many years of longing and struggle, 
There were years of oppression and loss of identity. 500 years before Jesus, these people, his followers, lost their homes, their ways of life, the pillars of their faith, all of it gone. The Babylonians invaded and burned their fields, destroyed their homes. They tore down the ancient walls of Jerusalem and razed the temple. You know, it was such a terrible time that we have a word for it, a proper noun, like, you know, the Great Depression or the Holocaust. It was called the exile. And in the last couple of years, you've probably seen images, maybe from the Syrian civil war, of entire towns reduced to rubble and void of people. I know you've seen images of refugees scattering across the globe trying to find somewhere to escape the devastation. That's what it was like as the exile began, as heartbreaking as the Twin Towers tumbling on September 11th, as soul-crushing as images of the body of a three-year-old boy washed up on the beach. The exile. And it was an exile from everything that the people knew about life and about God and about the future. And if you look at a timeline of the biblical story, you'll see that this exile lasted for 50 years. But if you asked the people who actually lived through it and asked their children and then their children down through the generations, you would hear the people of Jesus' day say that the exile was not really over yet. Yes, they had come back to their homeland from Babylon or wherever else they were scattered upon the face of the earth, but their enemies were still on top. First the Babylonians, then the Persians, then the Greeks, then the Syrians, and now in Jesus' day, the Romans. It's, it's sort of like if you lived in a beautiful home and one day you were kidnapped, kept for years in seclusion. Finally, you are released and you go home only to find that your kidnapper has killed all of your family, taken your home, and now you have to live in a room in the basement. Yes, your kidnapping is over, so to speak, but it isn't over. In Jesus' day, the exile wasn't yet over. In biblical vocabulary, you'll recognize this word perhaps, the people still needed redemption. They needed to be redeemed. And that meant that they needed a new exodus. From the anger and despair of this ongoing exile, the people looked back even further in their history, beyond 500 years in the beginning of the exile. They looked further back a thousand years to their birth as a people when they were slaves and God redeemed them from slavery in Egypt. The reason they had a wonderful home and family to begin with before the exile began was because in those ancient days, God had heard their cry and saved them. That was what the exodus was all about. So what they needed now was a new relationship with God, a new exodus, a renewed covenant that would bring about their redemption. In the book of Psalms, we have Psalm 43. It's one of the Psalms that the people of Jesus' day prayed in the synagogues and at homes. It was always on their lips. 
And we can imagine that they had their present, ongoing exile in mind and that they had very clear notions of what they hoped God was going to do about this exile. The words of Psalm 43 say, Vindicate me, O God, and defend my cause against an ungodly people. From those who are deceitful and unjust, deliver me. For you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you cast me off? Why must I walk about mournfully because of the oppression of my enemy? Oh, send out your life and truth. So the Bible then offered to Jesus and his contemporaries an unfinished story. A story that was in search of an ending, an exile in search of a true homecoming, an injustice in search of a reckoning, a brokenness in search of a wholeness, a death in search of a life. How had they thought this was going to end? How did they think the story would come to its completion? Well, it's pretty clear from the New Testament that they thought it would happen in two ways. That there would be a new zeal for God, which would motivate a military revolt. The holy remnant, as they thought of themselves, the holy remnant with God on its side would defeat these pagan rulers around them. Thus it had always been in Scripture, and thus they believed it would be when that great climax came, when Israel's God would become king of the world as they tried to make Jesus just five days before his death. There would be a leader, one anointed with oil by God to lead them in both this zeal for God and this might and of course, the title of this leader was Messiah, or Christ. And so they thought that the ancient story of the exile would be brought to an end with holiness and military victory. As is always the case, the political was also deeply personal. The exile that they so longed for to come to an end was not just about being an alien in your own land. It was about being an alien in your own skin, being an alien from God. And I don't think the people moped around all day, shedding tears in every quiet moment or bursting out in misplaced anger at every family member in the house. But life was harder than it needed to be. It was less joyful than it ought to be. And God seemed more distant than God promised to be. And always, the Romans were not far away with soldiers and taxes and contempt. Jesus' followers thought that in him, the search for an end to all of this was over. They thought he was that anointed one, that Messiah. But then they saw what happened. The crucifixion of Jesus was the complete and final devastation of their hope. Crucifixion is what happens to people who think they're going to liberate Israel and find out too late that they're wrong. There was no upside here. Jesus' followers knew from reading the book of Deuteronomy that a crucified person was under God's curse. The 
crucifixion had for them a perfectly clear political and personal meaning. It meant that the exile was still continuing, that God had not forgiven Israel's sins, that those pagans were still ruling the world, and that their thirst for redemption was not satisfied. They saw Jesus killed. Simple, clear, undeniable proof that nothing had changed. It seems to me that the right image here is um, a black hole. As black holes gather everything, even light itself, in their inescapable grip, so Jesus' death was a black hole of meaning and hope and everything that's worthy of the word life. There was no way for his followers to think about the days to come and believe that the future still had meaning. Meaning, hope, life, all of it had disappeared into that black hole, or, or it was all at least scattered there on the floor of the tomb alongside the body of Jesus. But wait. The body of Jesus wasn't there. How can that be? The reading that Beth Bozeman in the guise of Dave, read earlier from Luke, said that the women who came to the tomb to finish burying him, of course, because he was dead, they were perplexed. That's the word that was used. But I don't think that that quite captures the tone here. The better translation is really, they were completely at a loss. They couldn't even begin to make sense of this because everything had collapsed into that black hole of meaning. There was no, no, no thread of hope, no strand of life, no thread of the future to grab onto. They were completely at a loss. And then the men in dazzling clothes, and who wouldn't have on dazzling clothes when they had a message like this. They said, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He's been raised. And I think you know what that means. It means that meaning and hope and anything worthy of the name life is no longer scattered there on the floor of the tomb next to the body of Jesus because the body isn't there. It's no longer locked in the apparent nothingness of a black hole. The future is in the hands of God who brings our exile to an end with a new exodus through the resurrection. There is no more being an alien in your own land, no more being an alien in your own skin, no more being alienated from God because Jesus has been raised his followers, that's us we are able to look at the days to come and know that the future has meaning and that meaning pours forth from the heart of God of course, there will be times when we cry out in pain and tears, joy, 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 and hope that the nurse is going to come and fix all of our problems. But in the end, it is God who delivers us to new life. We can be 
free from our pain and tears, delivered from our exile. We can be united with God. We can see that the future has meaning because Jesus' death has been undone. Every form of death has been undone. And we can sing joyful, joyful, joyful. We adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Thanks be to God for the joy of this Easter day. Amen. <laughs>